Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. I am Jessamine Batario, the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at the Lunder Institute for American Art. This is my first year at Colby, and a definite highlight of my experiences thus far has been supervising and working with this cohort of bright undergraduate research assistants. They were assigned, they were each assigned to work with one or two of our inaugural research fellows, all scholars conducting original research on African American artists represented in the Colby Museum's collections. In the fall of 2019, the research fellows visited campus. They engaged with the Colby community more broadly. Uh, here, they had lunch with students and faculty whose classes addressed in interdisciplinary ways African American art and culture. During that visit, the fellows also had the opportunity to meet with their assistants individually to talk about their research plans and to look at the artworks in person. On the left, Katie Herzig is taking a closer look at what we've now come to fondly refer to as our baby banister. And on the right, Jane McCarran is consulting her assigned fellow, Professor John Ott. The research fellows were originally scheduled to return to Colby in March to present their work at our inaugural research symposium. This roundtable was also originally planned to coincide with that visit. It goes without saying why we had to change the format, but I would like to thank the RAs for their flexibility and willingness to proceed with a discussion here on Zoom. Uh, a few words about format. I will introduce all four participants and we will launch into a moderated conversation. Uh, if you have any questions during the discussion, uh, please enter them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you may do this at any time. We will address the questions later and also take the opportunity to take questions from the audience at that point. Please keep yourselves muted unless you are asking a question at the end. Thank you. Uh, and now for the introductions. Carter Wynn is a graduating senior from Washington, D.C., double majoring in art history and women, gender, and sexuality studies. In addition to her duties at the Lunder Institute, Carter is also the Artist Society co-president and the Colby Votes co-founder and student stakeholder. You might also recognize Carter from her time as a front desk worker at the Colby Museum. This year, she worked for professors Rebecca Vandiver and Tess Karabkin on a painting by David Driscoll and a sculpture by Marion Perkins, respectively. Uh, next, Jane McCarran is a graduating senior from New York City, double majoring in art history and psychology. She also played center on the women's basketball team and is involved in the Mini Mules program, works as a Colby Cares About Kids mentor, and is an admissions fellow. No stranger to the museum, Jane also served as co-chair of the Museum Student Advisory Board and was the Lindy Family Foundation curricular intern last summer. This year, she researched Norman Lewis's untitled abstract painting for Professor John Ott. And next, uh, Katie Herzig is also a graduating senior. She comes to us from Wyndham, Maine. Katie is an art history major with a minor in women's gender and sexuality studies. When she wasn't focused on coursework or Lunder Institute research, Katie worked as an area resident director of the Hall staff program. She's also served on the board of the Colby College Planned Parenthood Generation Action Group and has been involved in the Let's Get Ready program. Katie was assigned to three works for two scholars, two landscape paintings by Edward Mitchell Bannister for Professor Anna Arabindan Kesson, and one painting by Bob Thompson for Dr. Adrian Childs. And finally, Olivia Hochstadt is a junior from Highland Park, a suburb of Chicago. She's a double major in art history and Spanish. At Colby, she's involved in many extracurricular activities, including Ultimate Frisbee, the Contra Dance Club, the Outing Club, and Pottery Club. Outside of Lunder Institute research, she was also Professor Tanya Sheehan's research assistant. Last summer, Olivia interned at the Art Institute of Chicago in the Prints and Drawings Department through the Lunder Consortium for Whistler Studies. She spent the year researching two works, one by Romare Bearden and another by Hank Willis Thomas. Both were chosen by her research fellow, Kijo Lee of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to ask uh, my first question. Um, could you describe, uh, this is for all the research assistants, could you please describe some of the tasks assigned to you by your research fellows? Uh, I know many of you did very similar things, such as annotated bibliographies, uh, checking out and scanning source material. 
So I want to focus on something that was perhaps unique to each of you. Uh, so let's start with Jane. Um, hi. Um, so kind of the main project of my research was working on a catalog resume for Professor Ott. So focusing on Norman Lewis's work um, in the time between 1943 and 1949. Um, and so creating this catalog resume, I would find the images of works as well as their title, dimensions, medium, um, as well as their exhibition history and provenance history. So that's the record of ownership. Along with that, I would take the information I found in books and articles I read and take in um, key analysis of some of the works that I collected and then put it in the document as well so we could have further information about each piece. Um, and so I contacted a lot of collectors and um, galleries to find these high resolution images um, to create this catalog resume. Cool, thank you. And I know Katie, you contacted a lot of research institutions too, right? Can you tell us about that? I did, yeah. Um, so Professor Arabin and Kesson was interested in finding information on the place in which Bannister was working um, and was looking for historical descriptions and images of Jamestown and the greater Providence area um, and other public history records of sorts. Um, and so I contacted a lot of other arts and public history institutions to request this relevant information and images, um, which was really great. And everyone I spoke with was very helpful. Um, typically, even if they didn't have the information that I was looking for, they would refer me to another department or another organization that did. And so it sort of became this uh, like scattered team effort in tracking down the information. Cool. That's yeah. So it sounds like you did a lot of archival research. Um, Carter, a lot of your focus for the year was archival work too, right? Can you tell us more? Yeah. Um, yeah. Similar to Katie, I did a lot of archival research as well. Um, a lot of it was also to contact those art institutions that I was um, trying to get different materials from, whether that be um, like specific to my artists, which again were David Driscoll and Marion Perkins. Um, for, you know, digitized materials and scanned resources and photographs, um, but also working with specifically the David Driscoll Center a lot um, for, he has a, a set, set of papers, um, tons of boxes, and a lot of different um, and interesting information that was relevant to our research, like um, newspaper clippings, um, different correspondence that kind of led us um, down different directions for research. So kind of making sure that the communication between me and whatever um, research institutions I was speaking to um, was catered so that it was easier for them to, you know, find what I was looking for, kind of similar to what Katie was saying, like uh, a lot of people connecting you to, um, you know, their colleagues to, to find what you need. So that's basically um, some of the archival research stuff that I did. Yeah, and that's all kind of very traditional art history legwork. Um, so actually now I want to turn to Olivia, whose research was a little bit different because uh, a lot of it was done on the internet. Can you tell us uh, how that went and why it was that way in the first place? Right, so um, Dr. Lee was really interested in the artist process and the materiality of both the works that we studied. And so she had me um, collect and find source images um, for both of the works, mainly through social media. So um, she had me um, scanning Instagram hashtags, um, going through artists' um, accounts and museum accounts, finding installation photos and public reactions to the pieces. Um, and all that went to show how the different ways that um, people perceived the works, like affected um, like the history of the objects and um, how, how the variety of the ways that people saw them and like through the lens of a camera, especially with the um, retro reflective vinyl of the Hank Willis Thomas, um, just the layers that we see an object, how that affects um, what we say about it. Yeah. That sounds great, especially for the Hank Willis Thomas, because the materiality of that piece, like it really, you, there, there are multiple ways of seeing it with or without like the light or a flashlight. I remember um, that was something we experienced during the fellow's visit in the fall. 
Okay, so with all of these tasks, uh, what lessons did you all learn from that work about how to conduct art historical research in the first place? Uh, Carter, let's go to you. Yeah, so something that I learned um, throughout all this research was how to employ creativity in a way that I hadn't <clears throat> necessarily done in some of the other research for my classes. You know, uh, I think with art his history, I'm typically, um, you know, studying, or at least the class that I've taken, you know, so far, I've been studying pieces that have, you know, a decent amount of literature written about them, or for my WGSS major, perhaps it would be like a relatively, you know, well-known historical event or something of that nature. But for my pieces, you know, they're very understudied. So I had to sort of think about ways to um, search for related texts within the parameters of the research. So like, not necessarily using keywords, but okay, like, for Marian Mary Perkins, for example, we figured out that it was made out of, the sculpture was made out of alabaster. So we were looking at, you know, what buildings were using scaffolding that was made out of alabaster during the time in which Marian Perkins created this piece. So kind of thinking about, uh, thinking outside of the box about tactics to find information on the pieces was something that I really tried to work on throughout the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had to think a lot more contextually about the work. Um, Yes, and, definitely. Yeah, and on the other hand, Jane, I know, focused entirely, almost entirely on the visual. Jane, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so a lot of my research was working with primary sources and also um, websites like Art Source and Archives um, that really was going into the nitty-gritty and finding um, high-resolution um, copies of these images. So really, even if we had the high resolution, but then also going into books, if we couldn't find those high-resolution images and scanning them on, um, to the Word document so that even if we couldn't have that image, we could have some um, essence of what the work is. Yeah, so through it all, you kind of trained your eye, like looking at all these Norman Lewis images, right? Yeah. Uh, and I know, Olivia, that was something similar too. like your research was very kind of image focused. Um, can you tell us what you learned through that process? Yeah, um, so since I was spending a lot of time looking online and at um, everything from like professional photos of the works to just everyday people's like Instagram posts of the works. Um, I really learned how that the same um, like training your eye and also just being focused in what you're looking for. Um, and, you know, since I was really focusing on um, what the works were made of, um, it took a long time to like scroll through a lot of images um and that really it it taught me how to a be patient and also um learn how to move from a really focused um perspective and take what i like see and develop like a bigger picture view of the works yeah that makes sense like moving from minutia to thinking about it like uh both contextually and like what it all means uh, synthesizing everything you've seen. Um, how about Katie? What did you learn? I know it's something uh, practical. Yeah, um, I definitely alluded to this in my previous answer, but I think one of the most important things I learned was just how generous the arts community is. Um, it was incredibly helpful being able to correspond with various scholars from across the country who were always more than willing to send along relevant information and sources, or at least point me in the right direction. Um, and I think this was actually a really important revelation for me, especially now, uh, as I'm about to enter the workforce, um, that research and specifically art research can and often should be this collaborative effort um, and that professionals will be receptive to your requests for help. Um, because I guess prior to this year, it felt a little bit for me like the art world is this really intimidating space for me to enter. Um, and that feeling's still there to some degree, but definitely less so now that I've been able to engage with um, the art world professionals and have gotten nothing but positive feedback and support. That's great. That's great. Okay, so uh, my next question is, uh, how does the research you did for the Lunder Institute Research Fellows compare or contrast uh, to other types of research uh, you've done in your classes at Colby? 
And Carter already touched on this by talking about stuff she did for women's gender and sexuality studies. Uh, so actually, let's hear from Jane, who's double majoring in psychology, um, to think about a um, social sciences perspective. Yeah, so uh, for me, some of the greatest similarities I found was one kind of having to look at a large body of work to find tiny details or for psychology, um, research results that really add to your argument. Um, and kind of having to be nitpicky and be good at like scanning and then finding something that really relates and doing an in-depth reading of that. Um, also, one thing I found that you, applies to all research is you have to look out for confirmation bias. Um, that happens a lot in psych studies because they report obviously on their significant results, but sometimes you have to look a little deeper to find what was insignificant. Um, and the same thing with art historical research, people are obviously writing with an argument in mind. So a lot of what they find which, um, supports their argument, but it's important to see what's not um, in their essay or work. So that applies to both of them. Um, but then I would say one of the main differences is kind of the style of writing. Uh, psychology is much more scientific, um, so much not as much uh, personal style, um, very much scientific plain writing, but um, in art history, it's much more personalized and it's kind of what I love about it is people add more of their personal style and also history sometimes. Yeah, something about uh, the relationship between your own subjectivity uh, to history itself, right? Uh, which actually brings me to Olivia. Uh, so back to the humanities, since Olivia is a double major in Spanish, can you tell us about uh, similarities and differences to work uh, you've done in your Spanish classes and uh, the work, the research work you did here for the Lunder Institute? For sure. Um, so I'd say that most of the research I've done for my Spanish classes have been literature based. Um, and while both um, that relates to history in my Spanish major and art history, um, like the focus on texts from the past um, is a big uh, component of my Spanish re research. And what I've found is that um, we tend to, um, in Spanish, like contextualize and like confine what we're learning um, to historical moments, say like um, Spanish cinema styles of 1970, you know, we sort of just leave those moments in the past and just mark them in the past. Um, but with the research I did for the Lunder Institute, I really found um, that, um, we took these historical objects that were made um, in the past, like um, cotton from 1964. Um, we took the objects and like illuminated and like studied how they were already relevant and continue to be relevant to contemporary audiences. Yeah, and that's a, a hallmark of Kijo's particular approach as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. Great. Uh, so what was it like working for professors who are not in residence at Colby? Uh, how did you maintain open lines of communication with them? Uh, Katie, let's start with you this time. Yeah, so it was <clears throat> definitely a very unique experience communicating with professors who you're not seeing every day or every few days. Um, because and this is before, before the pandemic even. The last that I was going to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Now we're all pretty used to it at this point with the remote learning, but uh, I mean, one of the like hallmarks of uh, education at Colby, right, is this like small community. So you're typically uh, having in-person, like frequent contact with the people that you're working with or learning from. Um, and so uh, it's definitely a very different experience communicating so with somebody that you're not seeing every day. Um, but yeah, so my primary means of communication with my scholars was over email. Um, and this worked really well for me because it left each of us with a clear record of our correspondence and I could return to the conversations that we had to double check uh, that I had completed the tasks that were being asked of me. Uh, so there was a lot less risk of me forgetting things because I could go back and look and see what I had and hadn't done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the emails kind of even served as like to-do lists. Yeah. Okay, uh, and Carter, how about you? Yeah, from the start, Professor Van Diver and Professor Karopkin were, you know, very communicative and easily reachable. We 
sort of talked mainly over the phone. So we would have a fairly regular phone call scheduled during the first semester. Um, and we would talk usually bi-weekly. We would discuss, you know, where we were going with our research, update, update one another, you know, on status of ongoing tasks. And we kept track of those tasks um, through a checklist on Google Docs. So we would, you know, be able to track things virtually as well. But um, you know, all the research that I was conducting was entirely remote. So for me at least, there was never really an issue not being able to physically like physically be in front of my professors just because, you know, the research we were doing was something I could do, you know, in my dorm room or in the library or, you know, except for when we go in and actually look at pieces. <clears throat> yeah, great. Uh, and there are many ways to communicate with them. I know, Olivia, you did something a little bit different with uh, Kijo, right? Yeah, it was really fun, actually, because Kijo and I FaceTimed um, about every three weeks. And that was really exciting for me because I got to see her face and um, like see her excitement over the research that she was doing. She was very passionate about um, the work that she was studying um, and we would have these long conversations where I could really ask questions to clarify and she would really explain in detail what she wanted me to focus on um, and you know in between that time we would email and text even um, because she she emphasized you know that our our help was important and um, so I mean overall she just because I had the chance um, to develop a real personal relationship with her. She sort of became like a bit of a mentor to me. That's so nice. That's great. And now you know like a scholar in the field. You have a, a, a strong connection with, with a professional. That's great. Uh, and so my next question is, uh, what were some of the most rewarding and memorable experiences that you all had as a research assistant? Um, in other words, what did you enjoy the most? Or, or if you like, um, can you tell us about your most exciting research moment, your, your aha moment, your big surprise and find? Um, and so I'd love to hear from all four of you on this one. Uh, Jane, go ahead. Um, so mine was not necessarily doing research. So one of the most exciting moments for me was this past fall break, I went on the Merkin trip, um, which as you all know, is the trip that's funded by the Merkin family for all art and art history seniors. Um, to go on a networking trip um, through the school and so we actually got the chance to go to New York this year um, and actually got to see the new MoMA which now I'm extremely thankful because I have no idea when I'll be able to do that again um, and it was a really great experience walking through the galleries I saw a Norman Lewis piece kind of from afar and then like walking closer to it I was so I was able to identify the general time period it was made in and kind of made me realize that I actually do have a better understanding of his work and can be a more educated viewer in museums now. Wow, that's so cool. It's like you saw Norman Lewis in the wild and like you <laughs> had an idea of when it was made. That's like you're on the way to being like a connoisseur even, you know, that's great. Um, and Carter, how about you? Yeah, so one of the most like memorable and rewarding experiences for me um, was when the research fellows got to come to Colby, um, or when my, my research fellows got to come to Colby. I think, you know, it was super, super cool to meet them in person finally after having talked for a couple of months. Um, you know, we had this lovely lunch with the whole art department. And then um, the most exciting part for me is that we were able to go with our research um, fellows into the museum um, and have an experience to sort of sit with the objects that we were studying and really look closely at them. And it's one thing to, you know, look at a picture of an object on your computer screen and try to, um, you know, draw out information about it. But to sort of have the ability to look so closely at a work, especially for the Marion Perkins piece that I was looking at, just because um, to, to, to view the great gradations in the stone and the patterns and the dust on it and the different dirt kind of alluded us to you know, where was the stone coming from? So we were able to get a lot more out of the visual analysis um, in person. So that was something that I thought was very exciting. That's great. And then actually also, Carter, for you, um, over winter break, didn't you also meet with your fellows like elsewhere? Oh yeah, that was also another thing that um, I really enjoyed. I was able to meet with Professor Karopkin in DC. So we both actually live in DC. So we met at the Smithsonian American Art Museum 
over winter break and we were able to meet with one of her previous mentors who also was a cur who's a cur uh, excuse me a curator of sculpture at Sam and so we sort of spent a couple hours going around some of their sculptures and looking at the differences in the material and the way that it the way that the different materials reflect light um, and what that might say about our own um, research objects. So that was another very, very exciting moment because I was able to get that, you know, information from a curator directly, but also to sort of create those professional connections as well. Oh, that's great. Terrific. Uh, and then how about Olivia? How about you? I know you found something cool. I did, I did. Um, yeah. Uh, because uh, Kijo was really working with like close looking skills um, and I was looking at just huge amounts of images online, um, I definitely developed um, these like fine tuned like um, visual skills and just I found um, just walking around the Colby Art Museum and the Bixler Art Library, um, I would just like notice pieces of work and photography and books um, and just like walking around I um, was able to find source images or potential source images for Bearden's Cotton and that was really exciting um, like for example a Daniel Luna Vogue cover and just being able to see just like out of the blue these like pictures of right these black and white striped dresses um i could immediately see like wow that um is is it could like potentially be a source image for um bearden's work so that was really exciting yeah uh so talk about like a, a hot combo or like kind of like the source <laughs> material uh let's go to katie because i know so she did something similar happened with her yeah, something similar did happen. So um, like I mentioned previously, Professor Ramanin Kessin asked me to research and compile historical images and descriptions of Jamestown and the area around Providence um, in the hopes of sort of placing Bannister's uh, landscape painting somewhere within Jamestown. Uh, and in this search, I came across a picture of a coastline in Jamestown. It was actually on a postcard. Um, that looked remarkably similar to the scene that Bannister painted. Um, and so that was super exciting because it was also one of the very last things that I did leading up to the symposium and it ended up in the final presentation, which was really fun to see. Yeah, cool. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'd now also like to know uh, what were some of the challenges you faced and how did you uh, overcome them? Jane, let's go to you. Um, so definitely one of the challenges I faced was finding all the high resolution images that I wanted. To be fair, I did have a large list that I wanted to cover through the years of 1943 to 1949. Um, so a lot of times I would end up like scanning and fi or finding like links to high resolution images. So sometimes it was difficult to do that, but for the most part, I was able to find a way to at least get a scan of an image. Good, good. And uh, how about you, Olivia? Yeah, uh, well, because I was doing a lot of online research, um, a challenge that I faced was like combating that expectation of finding instant results from technology. Um, and I had to like scroll through like every existing like hashtag related to Hank Willis Thomas, like until 2013 from now. And that just took so much time. Um, so I definitely had to learn how to be patient in that regard. Um, and also um, I developed like a certain level of online literacy skills in sort of not finding the images that I wanted um, because the Hank Willis Thomas um, Blow the Man Down is not one of his um, more known works. Um, so I really had to resort to jumping from one website to an exhibition site to photo archives um, many times just because what I was looking for was um, pretty um, fine. 
Yeah, and I guess as a result of all that, you mentioned it. Um, now you have some online liter literacy skills, which are super important. Uh, Carter, how about you? Um, yeah, so unfortunately in the fall, um, one of the challenges that I was facing is that I suffered a major back injury. Um, and it, I had to go on medical leave for a couple of weeks and it made it really difficult for me to sit at a desk and do work for sustained periods of time. And so obviously that posed a complication to my research, uh, especially because with the symposium, we were, you know, we have a deadline. It's not just like things that can be pushed off. And so um, one thing that really helped me deal with this was just being very open and honest um, with my research fellows um, about what was going on with me and, you know, they were very, very understanding. And we were actually able to work out a plan for me to complete the work that I had missed um, during the portion of the work that I had missed during the first semester during Jan plan, which is not usually done, but we were able to work it out so that I was able to do that work um, remotely. So it, it ended up being fine, but definitely a little bit challenging at times. Mm -hmm. And I know Katie, you had a different kind of challenge. Will you uh, tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so I think one of the biggest challenges I faced was just getting a little bit of a late start on the work we were doing because I was hired slightly later than the other research assistants. Um, and last year, a previous research assistant began some of the preliminary work for this year's scholars, um, which the RAs this year were able to use as sort of a jumping off point uh, as they began doing research themselves. Um, and so I didn't have any of that preliminary work done either. So I was starting a little late and a little bit behind, but um, what was incredibly helpful was being able to look at what last year's research assistant had already done and what this year's RAs had already started and sort of mimic that work for my scholars as well. Um, and so it was a challenge that was pretty, pretty easily overcome, I think, because I had so much guidance from the other research assistants and from Dr. Batario and Professor Sheehan and my scholars. Cool, great, thank you. And um, so all of you, can you please tell me how uh, these experiences contributed to your professional goals? I know uh, three of you are graduating seniors. Uh, Jane, how about you? So um, my path actually is now taking a slightly different turn than I thought it was going to originally. So I'm actually starting work um, for an insurance company in Boston um, in July. Um, so I'm training to be an underwriter there. Um, so slightly different, not related to the arts necessarily, but I really think all the detail oriented work um, and the organization that I had to do for Lender Institute research, as well as just the relationship building um, will serve me well in the insurance field and beyond. Um, also, hopefully someday we'll lead back to the arts, maybe in art insurance in one form or the other. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, all these skills that you learn through the Lunder Institute as a research assistant or even really any as a student worker at the museum as well, all these skills are transferable into any other field too. Uh, Katie, how about you? I know your path, like even from being a freshman to now is, uh, is kind of an interesting story, right? Yeah, I'll give, I'll give the brief history of my <laughs> academic interests. So Ever since high school, I had the uh, big plan of going into the medical field after college. Um, and so I came into Colby intending to be a biology major and took a science heavy course load my first year in anticipation of this. Um, and then my sophomore year, I decided to branch out a little bit and I took a course in the art history department, which happened to be with Professor Sheehan. Um, and I recognized this passion or, um, that I thought deserved a little bit more exploration. So I sort of declared an art history major after taking this one class, um, <laughs> but retained my pre-med plans. And so for a little while, I was, <laughs> I was an art history major with a chemistry minor that eventually changed to a uh, women's gender and sexuality studies minor <laughs> on the pre-med track. And so I clearly had just no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but eventually I realized that pre-med was maybe not the right track for me. And that's when I really started seriously considering um, going into the arts. Um, and so having this opportunity to do research through the Lunder Institute has been 
absolutely amazing and um, really influential in helping me figure out these future goals because I've been able to connect with professionals at the Colby Museum and my scholars and just learn from learn from those conversations and help sort of plan my path forward. Great. Uh, and Carter, how about you? I, I know that you're going to pursue uh, art also, but um, with something else, right? Yeah, so I know that obviously things can change and given mm -hmm. the current circumstances, like there's a little bit of uh, room for um, room for change, but it's my, essentially it's my dream to become an art lawyer, fine arts lawyer. So I know that in order to do this, there are a myriad of hard skills that I have to obtain. So right now I'm planning on starting a position as a legal analyst um, in June, at the end of June to sort of sort of get up to speed with the legal aspect of that and then go to law, I, you know, be my plan to go to law school. But my experience working for the London Institute um, has definitely contributed to this dream because it's kind of allowed me to, to have access to a lot of individuals, powerful individuals within the art world, first of all, just through the connections that I've built. But then also I've been able to talk with so many people who've given me, you know, great advice about the way that the art, fine art world functions, you know, what type of skills do you need to have in order to make that dream a reality? What type of um, research you need to be able to have under your belt. So I've kind of gained this like general knowledge of how certain art institutions function and the pace of the industry just by the communication that I've done at Lunder, but then also working at the Colby Museum um, and talking to people. So that's kind of my, you know, my goal as of now. Great. And I know, Olivia, you're not graduating quite yet, but uh, this is something that has been on your mind as well, right? So can you can you tell us about uh, your work with Kijo and how that's um, made you think about what to do after Colby? For sure, yeah. Um, something special about uh, my relationship with Kijo was learning about her experience working in museum education and that um, I felt like her um, her work at the Cleveland Museum of Art was um, you know, especially um, unique because she was working directly with public audiences and um, was really active in in explaining um, how someone and a group of people's reaction like plays into the history of an object. Um, and so I was able to learn that from her and also just the importance of close looking skills. Um, so in a way like her, her specific focus um, in close looking and working with people directly um, in museum education really inspired me to sort of investigate that path of art history um, because I've I've sort of um, committed to working in the arts or I would hope in the future. I know I have, I have one more year at Colby, um, but I would love to learn more about museum education just based on what I did with, uh, with Kijo. Great, thank you. Uh, and so last question for all of you, uh, finally, what advice do you have for students who might be interested in becoming a research assistant at the Lunder Institute? Um, so this is a, a free for all. Let's let's see what you've got. Um, I would say that for me, what really helped, and I kind of figured out like a month or so in, was really blocking off a section of time a week that you're going to fully dedicate to doing this research. Um, I found I was able to get a lot more done when I sat down for like two hours, and if I did like twenty minutes here or like a half an hour there. Um, so I think going into it, if you just set your schedule and be like, on this like morning, I'm just going to do set two hours aside to do research. I think you'll find that you do a lot more in-depth research and it might take some of the stress off of adding it to your academics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I would say, I would say the same thing as Jane, um, blocking off time is really essential because the work, it ends up taking longer than you expect it to, just like anything else. And so um, having a set time that you are giving yourself to do this work um, 
it's helpful because then it just becomes another part of your schedule like any other class or another meeting um, because when you don't do that it it then becomes really challenging to fit things into your schedule because you always think you have more time than you do um, and then I think all four of us as well have had second jobs on campus or second research positions as well and so on top of full course loads and so things are busy and so setting aside time like Jane said is super helpful um, the other thing I would add for advice would just be using your resources um, and that includes all of the museum staff uh, Dr. Batario, Professor Sheehan, um, obviously our scholars and all of the research librarians as well everyone is incredibly helpful um, and no question is too simple to ask. Great. Um, yeah I would add on to that as well just um, telling um, future research assistants uh, to be patient because I found that um, the Lunder research takes a lot of time because it's so focused um, and just to know that eventually you'll get to where you want to be but um, you're gonna have to do a lot of digging um, to sort of like clear the path um, and also don't be afraid to reach out to people and always maintain an open line of communication with your scholars. Um, I think it's really important to like ask those clarifying questions and be like, I have no idea what that um, specific like printmaking technique is, you know, really clarify. Um, you want to make sure that you're on the same page as your scholars um, because you just wanna know, know what you're doing yeah yeah also another thing I, basically all of mine have been taken but the one last thing i would add would be to you know don't be afraid to ask your scholars but also you know everybody at lunder and the museum different um different questions that don't always necessarily relate to the research so if you have like professional development questions or you're curious about you know what what type of museums should you look at to work for or interest in the summer or who's someone you should talk to about this particular piece you're interested in like you know the resources are there for you to utilize and the people usually are more than willing to help so that's one thing I was you know, taking advantage of okay great uh, thank you all and um, I guess that's it for the program itself so if there are any questions feel free to ask uh, Beth and Lee so if there are none then we're done <laughs> Everybody did such a great job. Thank you. Um, it's not easy to be a research assistant working remotely, particularly, and you all, I know, were such an incredibly valuable part of this program in its first year. And in fact, one of the things that the scholars said they liked most about it and that really gave the program a kind of unique identity. So um, thanks for making the Lunder Institute look so good this year. And good luck to all of you in whatever comes next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to chime in with my thanks. I've just been um, just so enjoyed this conversation and hearing about the variety of research that you did, um, the various methodology methodologies that you took on, um, your discoveries, and uh, the relationships that you. Um, were able to foster through the experience. Um, so just really, really inspiring. Just wanna thank you all. I guess I wondered, um, I, mean, I, I have so many questions, but I, I, I did wonder how you all worked as a cohort. Did you rely on each other? Um, did you ever, um, you know, uh, kind of camaraderie? Was that there for you? Um, and then I guess, Probably maybe it's an unrelated question, but I was curious too. I've been thinking about um, you know how research begins, and I guess I'm kind of curious like what was the beginning for you um, because it had to be a process of exchange between the artwork and the individual to whom you've been assigned, you know, the scholar you've been assigned to. Um, so just yeah, you know, whoever might want to contribute to I guess those are two questions really: the beginnings part and also the cohort part. I'm happy to speak to the cohort part. <laughs> um, to answer that simply, like, yes, <laughs> we definitely uh, 
looked to each other and uh, spoke with each other about what we were doing, especially with Carter and Jane and I were, all three of us were in the uh, capstone for art history at the same time as we were beginning this research. And so there was a lot of um, <laughs> positive commiseration, I would say, like <laughs> not a bad thing, just all of us kind of, um, sharing our experiences and leaning on each other for support when we needed it. Um, so yeah, the simple answer to that, I, I think would be yes. Yeah, I was literally gonna say the same thing. I think, yeah. you know, like we were really able to talk about like the amount of research we were doing for different things at the same time. Yeah. It was definitely a lot to balance sometimes. <laughs> it was a really great experience. Um, and then touching on your other question, kind of balancing, I think a lot of times, like the starting off point, I think was me the first couple of weeks doing a lot of almost like catching up to like doing more um, research about Norman Lewis as an artist and kind of his background and history. And then kind of from there launching more into analyzing a piece specifically. Um, I'll add on about the beginnings of research question. Um, I know that we all had sort of a general um, bibliography about the artworks that we were looking at um, and we also had access to the uh, what Embark the database that um, the Colby Museum uses so that also had like preliminary uh, information about the works um, but for my research with Kijo she had me um, see the see both the beard and Anne Hank Willis Thomas um, in storage. Um, so not even like in Landa yet, but just seeing it like on the racks, like hung like in the middle of other objects and just like observing what it looked like and like the condition of the work um, in storage and just like how I felt when just like first looking at the piece, like with really knowing um, pretty little, um, little information about it. Um, just because uh, we sort of valued the 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 importance of just your individual feelings about um, the artwork and taking um, like unique aspects about the um, pieces and then eventually researching them online. Thank you. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lee and Beth, for joining, and uh, Jamie for for being here as well for um, some tech help. Uh, I guess that's it.